Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Tina Navarro was terribly afraid to be happy because after nearly every very joyful event in her life, a terrible blow happened. Even almost 20 years after that strange day when she, still a young schoolgirl, first realized the unusual law of her life, if she had too much fun, she would have to cry bitterly. Back then, she brought home a diary with year-end marks for the second grade, proudly displaying all straight A's. But at home, she saw her grandparents on her father's side in tears. She never knew her mother's parents. When Tina was about five years old, she began asking questions about all her relatives. She was very curious why most children in the kindergarten had two grandmothers and two grandfathers. Her mother avoided giving direct answers to this question for a long time, but then, thinking that Tina was old enough, she revealed the not-so-pleasant truth. The woman told her that she had been abandoned at the gates of an orphanage where she was raised. Sweetie, I was so little that I don't remember anything about my life before the orphanage, she said. So, I got used to living with people. I had nothing to compare it to, so I didn't even protest against what I now consider a terrible injustice. But most importantly, they fed me, raised me, and educated me there. And then I was lucky to meet your dad. Remember how we used to read fairy tales? Well, your dad is better than all the best princes. He noticed me and warmed me with his love. If you only knew how scared I was that his parents would be against me and separate us. Fortunately, my fears turned out to be unfounded. Your grandmother Valeriana and grandfather Javier became a real family for me, one I never had. So, you can consider them, your dad and you, my closest and most important people. You are my family. The story from her mother had a strong impact on Tina. It was her first close encounter with harsh reality. She felt deeply sorry for her beautiful mother. It was hard for her to imagine what it was like to live without feeling loved and cared for. Sometimes, Tina wondered who could abandon her little mother. In fairy tales, there were similar stories where a young princess was taken far away. In her fantasies, Tina's mother was the daughter of some noble parents, and their cunning enemies took her away. She created her own happy endings, like imagining that one day they would reunite and, after joyful reunions, they would discover she was their granddaughter. Of course, they would all become friends. Initially, after her mother's revelations, Tina was terribly afraid of having the same difficult fate her mother did. But over time, the fear faded away. By the time school started, Tina had already forgotten about it. Her parents and grandparents adored her. She didn't feel deprived of love and didn't bring up the painful topic that her mother had shared. On that fateful day when Tina had to grow up instantly, it turned out that her parents had been in an accident on their way to work. There were no bad omens or signs warning them not to go anywhere that day. Even if there had been, practical parents would probably not have heeded any advice not to go. They always did what duty commanded. In the morning, Tina's parents bid her farewell on her way to school, hugged her, and wished her luck. However, on that day, luck took a cruel turn away from the Navarro family, resulting in a terrible tragedy. As Tina's father was driving the car, a reckless driver attempting a dangerous overtaking maneuver on the opposite lane collided with them at full speed. The impact sent their car flying off the road like a leaf caught in a strong gust of wind. The twisted heap of metal left both the driver and the passengers severely injured. Witnesses immediately called for an ambulance and notified the police. However, for Tina's parents, this did little to change the grim situation. While Tina was enjoying herself at a school year-end celebration organized by her teacher, her parents were writhing in pain inside the ambulance. The joy of excellent grades and the beginning of summer vacation quickly turned into a somber atmosphere. Almost simultaneously, after several weeks in the hospital, Tina's parents passed away. They didn't even regain consciousness briefly, and Tina was deeply saddened that she couldn't tell them how much she loved them. After the morning rituals, which Tina went through as if in a daze, she couldn't bear to be in the apartment. Every time she passed her parents' bedroom, she would have a breakdown. Her grandmother, who had left her rural home to offer support, consulted with her grandfather. 
Javier, our little girl is dying from grief here. And living in this concrete box is suffocating for me too. You know, sometimes I feel like the door to the apartment will open at any moment and our son and daughter-in-law will walk in. It's hard on me, and only God knows how hard it is for Tina, she said. In the end, during an urgent family meeting, it was decided to move Tina from the city apartment to the countryside. A change of scenery, new experiences, and constant chores gradually helped normalize her condition. Tina worked in the garden and cared for the family animals, which flocked to her as if sensing that she needed their support. From morning till night, she had activities and amusements, and on sunny days, she learned to swim in the river under her grandfather's watchful eye. Tina even started to smile occasionally. It happened for the first time when she watched the clever mother cat and her kittens. The famous village mouser, Marina, taught her kittens all the tricks they might need in the future, and the nimble little creatures engaged in lively races with each other. In August, Tina's grandmother, who was relieved to see her granddaughter's soul thawing, came up with an idea and discussed it with her husband. Javier, Tina can learn just as well here in the countryside as she could in the city. We can transfer her to our school. Of course, it's already the last month of summer, and we don't have much time, but we need to act quickly. People will understand. The teachers at our school, although a bit old-fashioned, might even be better for our little one, she said. With her husband's approval, the grandmother turned to Tina and asked, Will you stay with us here in the village? Instead of answering, Tina tightly embraced her grandmother and her grandfather, who had joined the female half of their small but close-knit family. They decided not to part with the city apartment. After all, if Tina ever wanted to leave the village after finishing school, she would already have her own place. As her grandmother had anticipated, Tina enrolled in the rural school and was warmly received. A diligent and neat girl who had quickly made friends with almost all her peers and older kids during the summer, she easily found her place in the class. While studying wasn't exactly easy for her, she diligently overcame all difficulties, never wavering from her goals. As Tina grew older, her theory that her successes turned into misfortunes found confirmation many times. She would have preferred not to pay it any attention and consider all the incidents as coincidences, but it seemed that troubles always managed to neutralize all the joyful events. She should have been happy that her school years were coming to an end. However, it also meant that she would most likely have to part ways with her grandfather and grandmother because there were hardly any prospects in the village. Rumors had it that even the school was on the verge of closing due to a lack of students. The prosperous farm of past years had long since fallen apart, and a few entrepreneurs dreaming of reviving agriculture or dairy production on the fertile land couldn't provide employment for the entire working population. With her grandparents' blessings, Tina moved back to the city and into her parents' apartment to pursue higher education. On the day she learned that she had been accepted into the long-cherished educational institution, she was overjoyed and rushed to share the good news with her grandmother and grandfather. They celebrated along with their granddaughter, but Tina, internally expecting a catch, noticed that their cheerfulness seemed somewhat forced. Before the start of her studies, there was no reason to stay in the city, so Tina hurried back to her beloved family. Unfortunately, the ominous premonitions that had haunted her proved true. Tina managed to coax her grandmother into revealing the news, which hit her like a ton of bricks. Tina, my sunshine, please listen to me carefully and stay calm. I am seriously ill. I'm begging you, don't quit your studies, her grandmother said. Her grandfather chimed in. Valeriana, why are you scaring our granddaughter? Doctors can treat you, so stop feeling down. Tina noticed that her grandmother tried to appear lively and cheerful, but she couldn't help but see her wince from pain occasionally or abandon tasks more quickly than usual. That day, they went together to pick berries. Without even filling one bowl, her grandmother decided to head back home, saying, Yes, Tina, it is true that old age is no picnic. My head is spinning from the sweet aroma. I'll go lie down for a while, I suppose. Don't worry, you'll see. I'll rest for a bit and then go out again when it's cooler. Look at all the raspberries that have ripened. We should make some jam, it's so good for you. 
and I'll bake some sweet treats for dinner. The elderly woman lovingly stroked her now-grown granddaughter's head. Tina, trying not to cry, smiled. She pretended not to notice how difficult it was for her grandmother and that her illness was limiting her vigor. The sunny day was just beginning to show its strength, and it seemed to dispel all worries with its warm rays. Despite all the cares and concerns, Tina's heart filled with delight. In that moment, she simply adored the whole world. Insects buzzed around her, and the delightful scent of berries awakened her appetite. Alternating between picking the berries into an old green enamel bowl and popping some into her mouth, the juicy raspberries melted on her tongue, and even the seeds couldn't dampen her enjoyment of the moment. The young woman felt someone's intense gaze on her and turned around. Her grandfather, who had evidently returned from the river, was watching her. In one hand, he was holding an old fishing rod, and in the other, a bucket. Tina stopped picking berries and hurried toward him, ready for their usual tight embrace. However, her grandfather didn't let her get too close and proudly displayed the contents of the bucket. Look! There was a small silvery fish swimming inside. Before Tina could discern who her grandfather had caught, the weather rapidly deteriorated. Within moments, dark clouds gathered and a drizzle began, soon replaced by gusts of strong, biting, cold wind. Yellowed leaves fell rapidly. The berries in her bowl, so fresh and enticing just a moment ago, quickly grew moldy before her eyes. In an instant, they turned into mush, carried away by another gust of wind. Tina looked at her grandfather in bewilderment. Hey, what's going on here? She asked. The elderly man frowned and sternly said, Listen to me and don't waste time. Tina, you should go before it's too late. Please come back to the village as soon as you can. After uttering these words, her grandfather disintegrated into fine dust, just like the berries had a moment ago, carried away by yet another gust of wind. Tina screamed and woke up in tears. She would give anything to see her grandparents again, to hug them, and to have a meaningless chat about everything and nothing. She longed to tell them how much she missed them. The dream had been so realistic that Tina felt unsettled. Even though she didn't believe in any mystical stuff like prophetic dreams, she couldn't ignore her grandfather's plea. Moreover, a persistent thought kept turning in her mind that dreams from Thursday to Friday had a tendency to come true. This superstition, emerging from the depths of her subconscious, troubled her. The anniversary of her grandfather's death wasn't too long ago, and Tina was paying her respects to his memory. After some contemplation, she decided that her dear relative was asking her to visit his grave once more. But why the urgency? Continuing to ponder her dream, the woman mechanically performed her usual tasks and prepared for work. However, she couldn't concentrate on her job. Typos and errors kept creeping into her project. Tina spent over two hours on a task that usually took her only 30 minutes. Having completed half of her workday without taking a lunch break, she asked her director for permission to leave urgently. She explained that she needed to go. Tina checked the schedule for an intercity bus that passed near the village and rushed to the station. She knew she had to hurry, as her grandfather had requested. Fortunately, despite the good weather that allowed a delay in finishing the gardening season, she managed to buy a ticket. Realizing that the village store might be closed by the time she arrived, Tina bought a packet of pasta, a few cans of stewed meat, one of which she planned to take as a gift to the graveyard, some of her favorite pillow-shaped candies that reminded her of her grandparents, and a bottle of water for her journey at the nearest store. She remembered that there were grain stored in glass jars in the rural house, and in the cellar, there were preserves and potatoes for storage, so she could make do with those supplies. However, it wasn't in her nature to arrive empty-handed at the rural house. Senior relatives taught Tina to rely not only on supplies, but to replenish them as well. During the times when practically all the funds were spent on her grandmother's medical treatment, this habit had really saved the family. When the wallet was nearly empty and there was almost nothing on their credit cards, these reserves allowed them not to go hungry and wait calmly for the next payments. To distract herself from her somber thoughts, Tina couldn't resist opening the package of candy on the bus and popping one into her mouth. 
Although the taste wasn't quite the same as before, it still transported her back in time. When her grandmother was alive, she used to call these candies joy, while her grandfather would invariably correct her. My dear, these are candy buttons. Her grandmother would wave her hands in mock frustration and sometimes ask Tina. Tina, are you going to eat pie with candy buttons? The girl would burst into joyful laughter and cut herself off mid-sentence to avoid jinxing herself. Such conversations occurred with remarkable regularity. Now, the grown-up Tina understood that this playful debate was a form of endearment between her grandparents. In all her memories, her grandmother and grandfather had never even argued, let alone resorted to harsh words. Regardless of the fact that the pie had different names, it was delicious. Conversely, during the last two years of her life, her grandmother had hardly gotten out of bed and, of course, hadn't baked her tasty candy button pie. When Tina visited the village, she tried to replicate the culinary masterpiece by following the recipe to the letter. Nevertheless, it never turned out quite the same as before. However, her grandmother, after taking a bite, would praise her baking and always cheer her granddaughter. It turned out wonderfully. You've become quite the homemaker. Oh, your future husband will be so lucky. I wish I could attend your wedding and then peacefully depart to the other side. Tina always tried to change the subject when such conversations arose. Meanwhile, she couldn't help but think with longing about her elderly grandfather, who was already finding it challenging to care for his ailing wife and manage the household. She wished she could somehow simplify their lives. Gradually, modern appliances like a washing machine and a microwave appeared in the house, thanks to Tina's material support. She had switched to part-time studies, found a job at an architectural agency, and even taken out loans because most of her income was spent on medication. She tried to visit the village every week and could sometimes even tell with her eyes closed that she was approaching her hometown and it was time to take off the train. However, circumstances occasionally prevailed. For instance, there were times when she had to prepare an urgent project. Or when Tina fell ill and was afraid of infecting her grandmother and grandfather. How many times had she tried to convince her elderly relatives to move to the city with her, but each time they refused? Her grandmother kept repeating the same thing. No, dear. The home and the walls here help. The air here is not the same as in the city. You can see the greenery from the window. Javier takes me to the yard so often, sits me on the bench, and I enjoy my flowers. It seems like the pain subsides. And when the apples ripen, I pick them and inhale the fragrance. It feels like I'm being filled with energy. Why would I go from here to a brick box and eat plastic vegetables and fruits? No, Tina, thank you, but I won't go. Her grandfather supported her grandmother's opinion. Tina, don't pressure us, as they say nowadays. We have grown roots here with Valeriana. It's like with plants, when you start transplanting the grown ones, they can start to wither or even die before their time. So, Tina abandoned her idea. Her grandmother quietly passed away on her favorite bench, watching over her garden. She never got to meet her granddaughter's chosen one. It was another coincidence that Tina saw as a manifestation of the sinister fate looming over her. Not long before her grandmother's death, Tina fell in love. Usually, Tina avoided the company of men, which was quite challenging because she was an attractive young woman with her own apartment. Her grandmother, during her lifetime, tirelessly warned her granddaughter that, due to her beauty and her apartment, she might become the target of fortune hunters. However, it wasn't just the advice of her beloved relative that deterred Tina. She was afraid that her personal happiness would turn into a new tragedy. When a pleasant and even quite well-off man showed interest in her, Tina tried not to fall in love. She had no desire to pay an exorbitant price for that happiness. None of her friends or colleagues even suspected how much Tina longed to lose herself in feelings for a loved one and to have a child but she forbade herself from even dreaming about it. Tina directed all her energy into her work, and on weekends, she would go to her grandfather to help him with the household and offer support. She had long considered that traveling to the village and back took quite a bit of time, especially considering she had to adjust to the bus schedule. 
Taxi rides for such long distances were a luxury she couldn't afford. Tina came up with the idea of learning to drive a car. However, she didn't have access to a vehicle yet, and she wasn't confident that she could master this skill. The childhood fear caused by her parents' fatal accident still haunted her. Tina was afraid that driving a car would remain an insurmountable challenge due to her inner block. Only Antonio, whom Tina considered one of the most incredible coincidences, had managed to partly dispel her doubts and introduce unexpected emotions into her life. He had appeared in her life so discreetly, even though Tina had no intentions of entering into a romantic relationship. It all started with a conversation with her colleagues when she expressed her desire to learn how to drive a car. She didn't hide her apprehensions about whether she could master the art of driving. One of her colleagues, who had once failed miserably at becoming a skilled driver, advised her to find a private driving instructor online. Tina, listen to someone with experience and learn from my mistakes. First, find someone online who doesn't require their students, they usually call learner students, to have their own car. Sign up for a trial lesson. Go and see how it goes. In my opinion, this is better than paying a lot of money up front at a driving school. Here's how it was for me, I paid and went for a few lessons. As long as we had theory, I could bear it. But when it came to practice, I realized it just wasn't for me. Out of sheer stubbornness, I managed to get my license after three attempts. But they're just lying around, gathering dust. I'm happy taking public transportation or a taxi. Honestly, I would have been better off buying myself a good pair of shoes for the amount I spent at the driving school. Her colleague's words struck a chord with Tina. She also had significant doubts about her ability to handle a car skillfully. So, after browsing through ads, she called several private driving instructors. Most of them turned her down upon learning that she didn't have a car. But a man named Antonio agreed to help. Miss, it's not very convenient, but let's give it a try. I'm busy this week, but if you'd like, come over in the evening to the turn near the wholesale market on the weekend. I'll take you to the driving range, and we'll see how things go. After discussing all the details of their upcoming meeting, they bid each other farewell. Tina was a bit nervous, but she figured there was no harm since most of the reviews about his services were quite positive. During their meeting, she was quite anxious. Antonio made a favorable impression. He was slender, had a pleasant voice and beautiful eyes, and possessed a strong charm. When the instructor accidentally touched her hand while showing her how to shift gears, Tina experienced strange sensations. She felt that he could perfectly sense her embarrassment and the blush that was spreading across her cheeks, which distracted her from focusing on driving. With almost 15 minutes left until the end of the hour-long lesson, Tina pleaded, Antonio, I'm sorry, but let's end this foolish endeavor. Today, I've come to a clear understanding that driving is just not for me. I'll pay you for the whole lesson. The man smiled and tried to console his disappointed student. No need. Not everyone gets it right from the beginning. And from my experience, if everything goes perfectly from the start, it's even worse. The student starts getting arrogant, listens less carefully, and thinks they've got all the details down. But the road doesn't forgive complacency and carelessness. So, think it over, and if you decide to give it another shot, give me a call. Tina nodded and asked, If it's possible, could you drop me off at the bus stop, please? However, the instructor made a counteroffer. I don't mind going to the city anyway. How about I drop you off at home? Besides, I owe you some change for the unfinished lesson. Tina, exhausted from the intricacies of driving, agreed. During the ride, for some reason, she started talking to Antonio and shared with him the reason that had prompted her to learn how to drive a car. He listened without interruption, and when they parted ways, he refused to take any money from her but asked for permission to invite her on a date. You know, I enjoy spending time with you so much that I probably owe you for your pleasant company. Their relationship began on the date when Antonio took Tina to watch a car race. Tina tried not to admit it to herself, but she had fallen in love. Antonio became the only guy she introduced to her grandfather. This also happened almost by chance. 
Tina warned Antonio that they wouldn't be able to meet the following week. I'm going to the village for a week. I managed to get some time off during the weekend. I need to help my grandfather with the harvest. He's trying to manage, but I understand that it's tough for him. To her surprise, Antonio reacted unexpectedly. Well, I don't have any plans right now. I can cover for myself at work. I'll take you there and provide some extra muscle. We'll get things done faster and there will be more time for relaxation. I really don't want to part with my beloved girl. Besides, having an extra pair of strong hands will definitely be useful. Blushing with embarrassment, Tina agreed. She was worried that her grandfather might not like Antonio, but their introduction went quite smoothly. The young man didn't handle the shovel very skillfully and often cut potatoes in a way that got him reassigned from that task. However, his help in carrying the potatoes for drying and sorting proved to be invaluable. Seizing the moment when Antonio was busy with the car, her grandfather, embracing his granddaughter, delivered his verdict. Well, this Antonio seems quite positive from all sides. He doesn't shy away from work. It's clear to me that he's genuinely interested in you. But I wouldn't advise you to rush into things. You mentioned that you've only been close for a few months. So, take a closer look. It's a shame that your grandmother didn't live to see this. She had a knack for reading people like a book and would have known exactly who Antonio truly is. Valeriana would have told you whether it's worth continuing the relationship or better to part ways and forget it like a bad dream. However, Tina's heart and mind were filled only with Antonio's positive qualities. She didn't wait for him to propose, she practically did it herself. One day, when Antonio complained that he would have to move because the apartment owner decided to have his adult daughter live there, Tina spontaneously invited him over. Listen, maybe you can come live with me? I think it would be more convenient. You need a break from your flights. It's quiet here. Plus, we'll get to see each other more often. Lately, it feels like we can never meet. You're on a flight, I'm on a business trip, or I'm with my grandfather. Antonio was delighted and thanked her warmly. You know, you're saving me. Tina considered herself a married woman. She was happy to make her beloved happy, and she saw his absences as a reasonable price to pay for the days when he was by her side. She even felt that fate, after teasing her to its heart's content, had finally forgotten about her, and now she could live in peace. When Antonio presented her with a beautiful ring on March 8th and officially proposed to be his wife, Tina couldn't help but cry. I'm so happy. But, if you don't mind, let's not have any extravagant celebrations. Antonio shrugged, agreeing with his beloved. The most important thing to me is being with you. The rest is up to you. The couple took their time choosing a date and decided to get married in mid-August. They planned to spend their honeymoon in the village. Tina was touched by Antonio's respect for her beloved grandfather. She was pleased that he was understanding of her trips to the countryside and even offered his help when possible. Of course, Tina invited her beloved grandfather to the celebration and, trying not to frighten her happiness, she began preparing for her wedding with the man she loved. Two weeks remained until the August wedding date when a neighbor from the village told Tina that her grandfather Javier had been admitted to the district hospital with a suspected stroke. Tina rushed from work to visit her relative and, if the attending physician permitted, to transfer him to the regional hospital. But it was all in vain. His heart, weary from life's hardships, gave out. Her grandfather passed away before her eyes, tears streaming down her face. The bride canceled the wedding due to her grief, but neither the groom nor the invited guests dared to object. Tina didn't even want to have a civil wedding and asked Antonio, If you can, could you live with me in the village, at least for a short while? I don't want to leave my home until 40 days have passed. Instead of a joyful post-wedding vacation, it turned into a mournful work shift. Tina had to deal with the harvest, to which her grandfather had devoted so much effort in planting and growing. Antonio's help came in handy, as without him, she would probably have cried all the time. Tears came at the slightest provocation. 
She would get upset even when she picked up a shovel whose handle had been polished to a shine by her grandfather's hands. Or, passing by the clothing rack, she would smell a familiar scent. The nerves of Tina, who was now completely alone, were on the verge of bursting, and she had a very hard time dealing with her grief. Despite the physical labor and fresh air, she developed insomnia. She tried not to wake up the man sleeping next to her. She lay there thinking that perhaps, if she had been more insistent, her grandfather would still be alive. Why didn't I persuade him to move to the city or at least take him to the clinic for an examination? Maybe I could have extended Javier's life? Such thoughts and unanswered questions tormented Tina. Antonio, on the advice of a pharmacist, bought calming medications for his beloved. With them, she didn't feel the heartache as acutely. At least she stopped crying incessantly and began sleeping through the night. Tina couldn't bring herself to sell her grandfather's house. It was there that her meaningful childhood took place, warmed by the love of her grandfather and grandmother. Within those familiar walls, she felt tranquility and solace in her heart. Antonio, stuck in the status of a perpetual fiancé, often traveled between the cities, and Tina offered. Listen, if you happen to pass by on the highway, you can always stop at this house. Park your car in the yard. Relax like a regular person. So, take the spare set of keys, don't hesitate. I think my grandfather would be pleased that his home won't be abandoned. In the spring, Tina asked the local tractor driver to plow the garden. She understood that she wouldn't be able to fully tend to the farm, but she didn't want the land, which her grandparents had poured their hearts and hard work into, to be overrun by weeds. During the May holidays, Antonio was on another work trip. However, Tina, accustomed to all kinds of rural chores, managed without his help. She planted a couple of buckets of potatoes and sowed the rest of the area with mustard, leaving a little space for pumpkins and zucchinis, which didn't require much care. When Tina returned for her grandfather's anniversary, with Antonio's help, she quickly harvested the crops. Now, just over a month after that sorrowful day, she was heading back to familiar places, reminiscing about her loved ones. Antonio hadn't called her for a couple of days, which occasionally happened because he visited places with no cell reception. However, at this moment, Tina desperately longed to hear her beloved's voice. She scrolled through her call list and dialed Antonio's number. A robot's voice responded, indicating that the subscriber was available. The village was approaching, and it was time to get off the bus. No one else got off at the stop with her, and Tina sadly noted that the village was still far from revival. Her legs were a bit swollen from sitting for so long, and her not-so-comfortable office shoes weren't suitable for a cemetery visit. She glanced at her smartphone screen and realized that it would be dark in an hour or two, so Tina decided to postpone her visit to her loved one's graves until morning. She hurried to a familiar house, not far from the highway. It was only necessary to go three streets deeper, and there it was, her own. Her grandfather, Javier, had asked her during his lifetime, Tina, you can update the inside of the house as you like, but leave the outside as it is. And when I'm no longer here, don't forget to repaint the window frames. Your grandmother and I used to choose and carve patterns for them. Well, you updated the window frames in memory of us. Tina would always scoff at her grandfather's instructions. Well, why are you worrying? You're still strong. Now, like every time she visited the village, before even entering the yard, Tina automatically checked the condition of the window frames. In some places, the paint had already peeled off, and in a few spots, it seemed like the planks had shifted slightly from their original positions. After all, a house without its owner was practically an orphan. Tina began mentally making a list of the purchases she needed to make early the next morning and planning her day to ensure she had enough energy for everything. However, after stepping over the threshold of the house, her thoughts took a different turn. She was greatly surprised to find that the circuit breakers at the entrance were in the on position. When leaving the village, Tina usually disconnected the power, just in case. However, she didn't dwell on this oddity. Her preparations for departure the last time were chaotic, and she could easily have skipped her usual routine. 
Alternatively, Antonio might not have turned off the electricity when he visited for a break. Tina turned on the light in the hallway. With joy, she took off her worn-out shoes and entered the room. It turned out that the strangeness of the automatic switches was not the only reason for surprise. Curled up on the high bed like a kitten, she was a little girl. Tina felt uneasy. It wasn't frightening, but the unpleasant feeling of someone intruding into her home made her softly call out. Hey, hello. Who are you, and how did you get here? The girl lifted her head. Still half asleep, she squinted at Tina, then fluttered her long eyelashes and explained. My name is Sylvia. I'm six years old. I came here with my mom and Uncle Antonio because we had to leave our apartment in the city quickly. Mom said it was necessary. Examining Tina closely, the little guest exclaimed. Wow, I know you. There are a lot of your photos here. You're Tina, right? Uncle Antonio's sister? When my mom and he were getting ready to leave, he gave me photo albums first. I managed to ask who was on the cover. It was your photo. He said it was his sister. Are you younger or older than Uncle Antonio? Tina's head was spinning with surprise and unexpected news. Not only did her fiancé bring some woman and a child to her countryside home, but he also told the child that she was his sister, not his fiancé. Quite an interesting turn of events. She wanted to scream and throw things, but the little girl was completely innocent of Antonio's deceit. Tina confirmed the girl's guess and asked, Yes, Sylvia, my name is Tina. By the way, have Uncle Antonio and your mom been gone for long? It was still light outside when they left. They said they'd go back to our old apartment to get the remaining stuff and come back right away. They promised to bring me cake. They told me not to turn on the kettle and not to go outside. They said to behave quietly and not turn on too many lights. So, I was looking through the photo albums while it was still light. Then I started feeling bad, got tired, and wanted to sleep. It looks like I fell asleep. Sylvia smiled and concluded her little story. Well, I took a nap, and then you came. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to tidy up. Tina, who was also uncomfortable with a stranger rummaging through her grandfather's cabinets, reassured the little girl. It's okay. I'll clean everything up myself, don't worry. Tina guessed that the girl, who had spent almost the entire day sitting and sleeping, might be hungry, so she tried to ask as hospitably as possible. Sylvia, are you hungry? The girl politely declined. No, thank you. My stomach hurts a lot. Tina wasn't very familiar with what children of preschool age should look like. She had seen them in stores, on the streets, and on public transport, but she hadn't had much close interaction with them. However, it didn't take much experience to realize that Sylvia didn't look very healthy right now. The rosy cheeks on her fairly pale face seemed artificially painted on. Tina briefly hoped that the girl had just woken up recently and had a red mark from sleeping on her cheek. But the symmetrical redness quickly dispelled that assumption. The woman noticed that the girl's condition was deteriorating and asked, Let's take your temperature, okay? Sylvia obediently agreed, and Tina quickly fetched the first aid kit, mentally thanking her grandparents for teaching her to always have at least simple measuring devices and a small supply of common medicines in her home. The old mercury thermometer didn't bring good news. The bright mark on the scale showed almost 38 degrees. Tina tried calling her fiancé again, but Antonio's phone was still unreachable or turned off, and she didn't even know what to think anymore. Trying not to scare the little guest with a frightened face, Tina asked, Sylvia, do you know your mom's phone number? The girl nodded and, wincing in pain, pulled a small children's backpack in the shape of a soft toy from under the pillow. She took out a notebook from it, opened the cover, and dictated her host's home phone number. However, another hope for clarifying the situation proved to be in vain. Sylvia's mom was also unreachable. Tina tried not to panic, but seeing that Sylvia was not well, she couldn't help but show concern. The girl had one episode of vomiting, and Tina, 
after comforting the frightened guest, tidied up and turned to the internet. Judging by the articles she quickly read online, Sylvia's symptoms pointed to appendicitis. Of course, Tina understood that without a medical background, she couldn't make an accurate diagnosis. However, most of the texts indicated that delaying seeking medical help when there was suspicion of appendicitis was not advisable. Tina considered it unacceptable to risk the child's health and possibly her life. No matter how she ended up in her home through her deceitful fiancé, she couldn't remain indifferent. After dialing the emergency service number, she briefly explained the situation to the operator, and her call was redirected to the medical team. Reiterating the symptoms, Tina understood from the caller's response that she had done everything correctly. The woman provided her address, received a brief mini-instruction on what to do in case Sylvia's condition worsened, and now all that was left was to wait. Antonio's number was still unreachable. Seizing a moment when the girl seemed to be feeling a little better, Tina asked, Sylvia, do you happen to know where your documents might be? They might be needed. The girl replied, They are in my mom's bag, but she took it with her, I think. Tina had to search the house, but in the check pattern suitcase, similar to the ones the transporters used to carry goods, there was only clothing, a few toys, and a couple of books about a boy wizard. While waiting for the ambulance, Tina comforted Sylvia, who was getting worse. She asked if the girl went to school and received a negative answer. Not knowing how to behave with the suffering child, Tina tried to engage her in a conversation about literature. I was checking the bag for documents just in case and saw the books. Have you read them already? Who did you like the most? The girl weakly smiled. My mom is into them. I prefer comics. I can't read very well yet, but in comics, everything is clear as there are pictures. Time passed slowly, and Tina was constantly afraid that Sylvia would suddenly get worse. Pushing away thoughts of a tragic ending, she forced herself to find new topics for conversation with the girl. The sounds of the approaching ambulance seemed more beautiful to her than her favorite musical compositions. The doctor who conducted the examination shook his head. In any case, whether you like it or not, we'll have to go to the hospital. Pack your things and documents, get dressed, and let's go. We'll wait in the car and prepare the necessary paperwork. The medical team left. The girl, who had been remarkably calm until that moment, suddenly grabbed Tina's hand and pleaded. Aunt Tina, please come with me. I'm terribly scared. I can't do this alone. Please. Tina's heart skipped a beat. There was so much hope in the girl's eyes that she couldn't let her down, so she agreed. Okay, don't worry. We'll go together. Just if they ask, I'm your aunt. Let's say a cousin. My name is Tina Navarro. Got it? Of course, in the district hospital, they might recognize her, but there was nothing else to do. She didn't know what else to come up with to avoid explaining how they had really met. Right? Seeing the girl's nod of agreement, the homeowner continued. Besides your name, tell me your last name and patronymic, because I think they'll need to include them in the paperwork. Sylvia, solidly, as if momentarily forgetting the pain, replied. Santa Sylvia. Tina became more suspicious when she heard the surname, coinciding with her fiancé's, but she couldn't dwell on solving riddles right now. She quickly wrote a short note to Antonio, explaining the situation and asking him to call as soon as he could. Then she got into the ambulance with the girl. The reception area of the district hospital remained just as Tina remembered it. The light yellow color of the walls was probably intended to instill optimism in visitors, but it brought back the most unpleasant memories for her. Fortunately, she found her passport in her bag, and thanks to the girl's pre-learned information, the paperwork in the reception area went smoothly. Tina's heart was pounding, but she was more concerned about Sylvia's health than being labeled a liar. The surgeon confirmed the diagnosis that Tina had suspected, and they began preparing the girl for emergency surgery. After filling out another batch of paperwork, Tina felt emotionally drained. She stumbled a few times when asked about the girl's allergies, but Sylvia came to her rescue. 
Perhaps in such confusion, adults dealing with sick children were nothing unusual, as no one gave her suspicious looks. Sylvia was taken into the operating room, and Tina was left alone in the room where even the most talkative people often lost their eloquence. After confirming visiting hours and taking a photo of the information sheet on her smartphone, Tina went outside. She needed to return to her countryside home, and considering that a new day was almost upon them with all the fuss and worry, she had no choice but to call a taxi. Almost at the moment Tina took out her phone to call, it rang. Antonio's photo and name appeared on the screen. Tina answered and heard Antonio's persuasive voice. Hi, sweetheart. Where are you right now? However, an unfamiliar woman and apparently Sylvia's mother interrupted the man's unhurried speech. Tell us quickly, where have you taken my daughter? She should be with me within half an hour, or I'll report to the police that you've taken my child. The audacity of the stranger infuriated Tina. She was about to give her a piece of her mind, but there was some commotion on the other end, and the phone was apparently taken back by Antonio. Tina heard him shout at the woman to read the note carefully and not freak out right away. Then, lowering his tone, he addressed his fiancée. Tina, please forgive me. Julia just got all nervous. She didn't even read the note properly before attacking. Tell me, how is Sylvia? It took colossal effort for Tina to restrain herself from causing a scene with her beloved fiancé, who had shown a very unexpected side of himself. Sylvia is currently undergoing surgery at the district hospital. They're removing her appendix. They said they managed to bring her in on time. You can visit Sylvia tomorrow or call the hospital's information desk to confirm visiting hours. I took a photo just in case. I'll send it to you now. Thank you so much, Tina. You can't even imagine how great you are. Wait there for a bit. I'll come pick you up so you don't have to call a taxi. Tina wasn't exactly thrilled to see her fiancé, who had prepared such an unusual surprise for her, but she was so exhausted from all the stress that she agreed. Okay. When you get closer, give me a call. I'll wait by the curb across from the main entrance. It'll be quicker than going around for half a block. While waiting for Antonio, Tina thought sadly about how her life had been normal just a day ago. There was hardly anything special in it. Home, work, occasional outings, meetings with Antonio, small joys, and almost no troubles. But after that strange message from her grandfather in her dream, everything had changed suddenly. She had met Sylvia, and now, thanks to the doctors, the girl was likely to get better. It was scary to think what would have happened if Tina hadn't listened to her grandfather and stayed in the city. Perhaps things wouldn't have turned out so well. But now, what would happen to Tina's life? She had already confirmed Sylvia's sanity. The girl claimed that Antonio had introduced her, Tina, as his sister, and there was no reason not to believe Sylvia. Tina could find only one explanation for such a strange act by her fiancé, and she didn't like it at all. Most likely, Antonio had been having affairs, and he had the audacity to bring his mistress into her grandfather's house, which was supposed to be their future home. Antonio's call interrupted the thoughts swirling in her head about the inevitable breakup, and Tina set out to clarify the situation. Barely nodding at her fiancé, Tina got into the car and interrupted his greeting and the torrent of gratitude for helping Sylvia. Antonio, no need for that. You'd better explain to me why I suddenly came to my grandfather's house and unexpectedly found an unfamiliar girl there. Antonio began to explain. You see, Sylvia and her mom, Julia, had to go into hiding urgently. They got into a very complicated situation. It's all tangled up there, loans, a tyrannical partner, his unstable cronies. Julia can't even reach her mother. She's too ashamed to return like a beaten dog after what happened. She wants to earn some money and come back with her head held high. Tina interrupted the man again. She spoke calmly, but internally, she was seething with anger and resentment. Antonio, I understand everything. You did a noble thing by helping a woman and her child who found themselves in a difficult situation. But why the hell did I suddenly become your sister, according to your words? 
When did this magical transformation happen? I practically consider myself your wife, and not too long ago, you were demonstrating anything but brotherly love to me. The car suddenly swerved as if Antonio were maneuvering to avoid an obstacle. The infuriated woman could see that he was not happy to hear her accusations or answer her questions. He pretended to pay even more attention to the road. Tina also decided to take a pause and postpone the relationship talk until they got home. After all, her loved one, or maybe just her former fiancé now, was driving, and their lives were in his hands. From there on, they drove in silence until they reached home. Tina felt a strong hunger pang, despite the nerve-wracking day. Considering that the last time she had eaten was just a piece of candy and some water on the bus, it wasn't surprising. It was the simple physiological need, and it was intensified by the immense stress. But the realization that she was finally about to reach home didn't make her feel any better. She knew that she would most likely have to meet the girl's mother and engage in a very difficult conversation. At her grandfather's gate, illuminated by the car's headlights like a print developing in a darkroom, a fragile female figure appeared. Tina guessed that it was the anxious Julia who had come out to meet her and Antonio. Upon seeing the car, Sylvia's mother hurried to open the gate, and Antonio expertly parked it in the yard. The welcoming woman closed the gate and approached Tina. Hello. As you've probably known, my name is Julia. I apologize for yelling at you on the phone. I just about lost my mind when I realized my daughter was missing. I didn't even notice the note. Thank goodness Antonio helped figure it all out. You have such a wonderful brother. Let's go inside quickly. I've prepared dinner. I understand that the most dangerous part is behind us, and I don't want to interrogate you while you're hungry. I'm very grateful to you. Well, why are you standing there? Let's go. You definitely need some nourishment. I, for one, could eat an elephant when I'm nervous. Just now, while I was waiting for you and Antonio, I nearly finished half a loaf of bread with sausage and cheese leftovers. While Tina washed her hands, the uninvited guest proceeded to set the table like a seasoned hostess. She didn't ask for any help, nor did she search for utensils, as if she had been here many times before and had completely made herself at home in this unfamiliar place. From the dishes laid out on the table, Tina could tell that Julia and Antonio brought the most groceries. Thinly sliced smoked sausage filled the room with an enticing aroma that made her hungry stomach tighten. Several types of cheese were neatly arranged on a separate plate. There was a dish in the center of the table, judging by the smell, generously seasoned with dried dill, and it sat in a pot, carefully covered with several layers of terry cloth towels. The refrigerator hummed quietly. So, she turned it on to put some more groceries in and keep them fresh, Tina thought, as if Julia had read her mind. Julia explained. We bought a cake for Sylvia, just as she asked. We also got some meat and a chicken. It's as if my heart knew what to get. We'll probably be able to bring some broth for Sylvia as well. I'll call the hospital tomorrow morning and check. Oh, thank you again. I don't even want to think about what could have happened if you hadn't come in time. The busy guest didn't stop talking, and a wave of frustration rose within Tina. Julia clearly had no doubts about her household skills, and everything else about the woman seemed to be in perfect order. With her attractive features, she reminded Tina of someone, but she couldn't quite recall who. Probably some actresses. It was no wonder that Antonio had suddenly turned his attention to her, forgetting about his fiancée, who had been abruptly renamed as his sister. The final straw for Tina's emotions was when she saw that the favorite bowl of her grandfather was filled with mushrooms that they themselves had pickled some time ago. This small detail hit the real homeowner deep in the soul. So, while she was at the hospital with the girl, this Julia had already been down to the cellar. The feeling of revulsion at this woman's intrusion into her grandfather's house was so strong that Tina forgot about her intention to have a civilized conversation. She sharply began to reprimand the guest, who had assumed the role of mistress of the house. And how do you explain all of this? You've been poking around all over the house? Have you found everything you were interested in, or are there still some corners you haven't looked into? 
Julia remained silent, not understanding what was happening, while Tina grew increasingly agitated. I want to ask you who allowed you to take charge here. The woman was about to answer when Antonio entered the room. Apparently, he had overheard part of the conversation between the two women. He tried to calm his fiancée down, pleading with the homeowner. Tina, please calm down. He bypassed his fiancée and stood next to the stunned Julia. However, his maneuvers and words had the opposite effect. The homeowner yelled, venting her anger. Gather your stuff and your food and get out of here. I don't want to see you anywhere near my house, and I won't allow you to move in with this lady and her child in my city apartment, Antonio. Look at what a knight you've become. If you want to play nobleman, go ahead, but do it on your own turf. Don't drag me into this voluntarily or involuntarily. I believe I didn't deserve such treatment. What you did was despicable. Unlike the now silent Antonio, Juliet attempted to defend herself and protect the interests of the man she considered Tina's brother. Listen to me, and don't be hysterical. Honestly, have you lost your mind like a little girl? I didn't meddle in the intricacies of your family relationships, but you're not entirely correct. Your brother also has a right to a share of this house and the apartment. So, if you don't want to divide everything voluntarily, for example, by leaving this property to your brother and settling in the city, then the property will be divided by the court. We do live in a legal state, and your brother has a right to part of the inheritance. Tina had never complained about lacking a sense of humor. Everything happening to her would be funny if it weren't so sad. It was evident to her that Julia staunchly believed Antonio's version. There was no point in causing a scene. Tina took her phone out of her jeans pocket and, in a calmer tone, explained. Of course, a brother has a right to an inheritance. The thing is, I don't have a brother, and I never did. Antonio is my now ex fiance who seems to be skillfully lying to both me and you. He used to call me his beloved. Now, as it turns out, I've been demoted to a sister. What a surprise. So, why don't both of you leave right now? and I'll completely forget about your existence. And if you don't want to do it voluntarily, as you put it, I'll call the police to the house. I don't think they'll give you much trouble, but it'll certainly frazzle your nerves. And if you're as legally savvy as you're trying to demonstrate here, you should know what penalties await both of you. I can only assume that, at best, explaining the situation will take several hours. Think about it, but don't forget that your daughter is in the hospital. Can you imagine how worried she'll be if her mother doesn't show up? Tina knew that she was hitting Julia where it hurt the most, the child in the hospital. However, after such an exhausting day, she had no energy left for sympathy. I strongly advise you to make the right decision. I'm giving you half an hour to pack up and get out of here in all directions. Julia turned to the man standing beside her and asked, Is what Tina said true? She's not your sister, but your beloved? Antonio attempted to justify himself, saying, Well, if I had said I was taking you, along with Sylvia, to my cohabitant's countryside house, would you have agreed? I'm sure you wouldn't have. You're quite proud. So, don't accuse me of being despicable. If it weren't for your pride, things would have turned out differently altogether. Now look at how everything has spiraled. Tina had grown tired of listening to their verbal dispute and interjected with the information that time for packing was running out. Hey, go wherever you want and argue to your heart's content, but leave me and my house alone. Time is running out. Keep in mind that in 27 minutes, I'll be calling the police, and whoever hasn't hidden won't be my fault. Seeing that Tina wasn't joking in the slightest, Antonio began to gather his clothes and tools that he had brought to repair the house. He tried to say something to Tina about how he had done repairs with his own money, but Julia interrupted his grievances. Antonio, where's your conscience? In reality, Tina deserves thanks for not immediately reporting us to the police, and you're trying to portray yourself as a victim in this foolish situation. Everyone fell silent, broken only by the sound of doors closing and the rustling of drawers. Tina seemed to fall into a strange numbness. 
She watched as the person she had considered her reliable support carefully checked if he had left any of his belongings behind. During their time living together, she never noticed his meticulousness. Perhaps there had been no reason for her to admire it, or maybe such situations had never arisen. After completing the gathering of his things, Antonio started packing the food from the table, placing it all into bags. Surprisingly for Tina, Julia interrupted this unpleasant task. That's enough, Antonio, let's go. I have no more strength to look at this mess. Antonio waved his hand and, without even looking at Tina, quickly exited the house. However, Tina made him pause. Antonio, return the keys to my city apartment right away, so you won't be tempted to settle there. I'll give you all your belongings, but you won't enter alone. You will retrieve them in my presence and with witnesses. Not only to prevent you from taking anything extra, but also to ensure you won't accuse me later. I'm just afraid to even think about what to expect from you anymore. Tina herself didn't understand where this sudden fearlessness came from. Her anger at her ex-fiancé gave her determination, and she didn't realize that the truth was entirely on her side. She couldn't physically force the uninvited guests out, and before the police arrived, they could easily have taken matters into their own hands. If Antonio had gotten angry, he might have just pushed her against the wall. However, playing it cool, he silently removed the keys to the city apartment from his keering and threw them on the floor. Passing by the homeowner, Julia slowed down a bit, looked into Tina's eyes once more, and apologized, thanking her for helping her daughter. I don't even know how to express what I feel. If you can, please forgive me for everything, and may your good deed be generously rewarded. You practically saved my daughter. Forgive me, bye. After escorting the uninvited guests out of the house, Tina followed them to make sure they didn't cause any trouble. Although Julia seemed to apologize quite sincerely, who knew what was on her mind? Besides, Antonio had nearly destroyed his image as an honorable person. Tina, acting like a supervisor, walked in the footsteps of her former fiancé and the uninvited guest. Then she waited for Julia to open the gate. For some reason, she didn't want to turn her back on her recently beloved person. When Antonio started the car and drove away from the yard, the homeowner let out a sigh of relief. She had never believed until the last moment that she could avoid a violent resolution of the conflict. Therefore, she carefully locked the gate, inserting a metal rod into the brackets for extra security. In the house, she had to block the door in a not-so-reliable but simple way by jamming a wooden mop handle into the door handle. Her grandmother had always called it lazy. On the bed where Sylvia had writhed in pain not long ago, family photo albums still lay. Although Tina was nearly starving, she found it disgusting to eat what Julia had prepared. First, Tina placed a pot on the stove, filling it with water to boil pasta. While waiting for the water to boil, she carefully placed the remaining dishes from the table in the refrigerator. She didn't think it was right to throw away the food and decided to take the stranger's groceries to her neighbor in the morning. She seemed to have some farm animals. She would find someone to feed them. Tina began to tidy up the small mess left behind by Antonio. She also wanted to put the photo album back in its place, but the faces of her loved ones in the pictures looked so understanding and sympathetic that she settled comfortably at the table and started looking at the photos page by page. The water had already boiled, but Tina didn't want to interrupt her silent conversation with her beloved people, so she brewed herself some coffee, thinking that she had conveniently forgotten to add salt or spices to the water. Memories flooded back to Tina from the pages. Here were her parents and her in the park. She vaguely remembered that day, with only fragmented impressions of various attractions remaining in her memory. However, the photographer had captured that day. Now, the grown-up girl, even older than her parents in the picture, admired them. They seemed so young and joyful. No one could have known then that they would meet their end in about a year. Tina wished everything had turned out differently. She didn't know how long she had been sitting at the table, savoring the moments of her dear ones and completely forgetting about the steeping tea. It was probably time to go to bed since there would be a lot to do tomorrow. But Tina couldn't voluntarily tear herself away from the photo album. 
While Tina was contemplating those precious moments, suddenly the phone rang. The number that appeared on the screen vaguely rang a bell with Tina. She recalled that Sylvia had dictated this unusual combination to her, and she had written down these numbers on forms in the reception area. So, most likely, it was Julia calling. Tina initially wanted to block the number out of anger, but then she thought that it might be related to some bureaucratic details about Sylvia's hospitalization, so she answered the call. Speak, but make it quick. I'm sorry, this is Julia. I feel very uncomfortable reaching out to you. Tina's peaceful mood instantly vanished, and her anger grew as she listened to Julia's timid speech. She didn't make any effort to be polite to Julia. What else do you want from me? I've arranged everything for the girl's hospitalization and listed your number as the first contact. That's it. My mission is complete. Julia refuted Tina's assumption that the call was about the girl. No, I'm not calling about that. Tina was close to boiling point but spoke in a cold and sarcastic tone. Then why are you calling? Did you suddenly remember something you forgot to take with you? I can send it by mail. Just provide the address. I don't need anything from you. The voice of the caller became very sad and quiet, to the point that Tina could barely hear Julia's words. Antonio and I had a big fight along the way. He dropped me off when we weren't too far from the village. I can't imagine how to get to the district center at night. You're the only one I know here, even though we met in such an unusual way, so I can only hope for your mercy and a miracle. I'm currently at your gate. If possible, please toss a blanket over the fence. I'll spend the night here, and in the morning, I'll try to hitchhike to the district center. Tina's anger suddenly dissipated. After all, she was in the heat, and Julia seemed to have it even worse. After a moment's pause, she replied that she would come out to the gate and then hung up. Julia clearly didn't expect Tina to open the door in front of her and offer. Shall we go inside, then? It's not me outside. You might freeze. I don't want any guilt on my conscience. Seeing the hesitation in the woman who had come, Tina added, Don't worry. I won't be interrogating you about our relationship. It's pretty clear already. It seems Antonio had both of us wrapped around his finger. We can consider ourselves friends by misfortune. Is that okay? Julia was relieved and agreed without hesitation. She felt awkward being back in the house where such dramatic events had unfolded recently, revealing the unpleasant truth about Antonio. However, it was getting quite chilly outside. Tina further secured the house by jamming a mop handle into the door handle and inviting her guest to sit down. We'll tidy up a bit, have some coffee, and then head to bed. Julia agreed. But when the hostess started to clear the table and remove the photo albums, Julia suddenly stopped her and pointed to one of the pictures. Oh, this woman looks exactly like my mother when she was young. I don't know who the man standing next to her is, though. How do you have this picture? Tina was just as surprised as her guest. Actually, that woman is my mother. My father is the man next to her. This picture was taken by my grandfather near our city house. On the next page, you'll see me standing next to them, along with my grandmother. Look. Julia even opened her purse, took out her phone, and asked. Wait a moment. She quickly swiped her finger across the screen, obviously looking for something. Soon, she handed her smartphone to Tina. On the screen, there was a social media page. Julia explained. This is my account, and in this album, you'll find photos of my family. Take a look at the black and white photo. My mother had her portrait taken at a studio, which was fashionable at the time. Doesn't this woman remind you of anyone? Tina examined it more closely. Indeed, there was a strong resemblance between the woman in the picture on the screen and the one in the paper photograph. It might even seem like it was the same person, only captured in different settings and with different cameras. However, the year printed in the corner of Julia's mother's studio photo clearly indicated that they were different people. After all, Tina's mother was very young at the time. Julia asked the homeowner, Listen, 
Could our mothers possibly be related? My maiden name is Fernandez. What's yours? Tina, who had also entertained the thought of a possible family connection between the two women, sadly replied, I'm afraid I won't be able to shed any light on this matter. My mother grew up in an orphanage. I know nothing about any of her relatives. She never looked for them or told me about it. I was very young at first. Then my parents passed away, and my grandparents had other priorities than searching for my mother's family. Julia's face stretched in amazement, and she hurried to share some incredible information. Listen, this might sound unbelievable, but I'm almost certain we're relatives. My mother, to put it mildly, came from a troubled family. Well, to be more precise, there wasn't much of a family there. Our shared grandmother, for some reason, had taken to drinking. My mother said she used to live okay, but then something unpleasant happened at work or she found out about my grandfather's infidelity or something like that. Anyway, things went downhill. She got divorced and left her job voluntarily. She made a living by sewing at home. She was quite beautiful, which is why she always had plenty of suitors. My mother was the eldest child from her first husband, and she mentioned that sometimes the house felt like a madhouse. To cut it short, this woman gradually spiraled downward, forgetting all decency. She periodically had children with her admirers. Grandma would either leave the girls at the maternity hospital right away or send them to an orphanage later. With the boys, she usually kept them and raised them herself. It seemed like she thought they'd be more useful to her, or maybe she hoped they'd inherit something from their fathers. But none of the biological fathers showed any desire to take on the responsibilities of supporting a growing brood. However, from what my mother told me, most of the time, the burden of taking care of the children fell on her. She didn't provide me with too many details. Just the basics. It was too painful to remember the details of an almost impoverished and half-starved childhood. At the age of 16, my mother wanted to run away, but by that time, she already had three younger brothers. So, this nightmare continued until she turned 18, and then Grandma just froze to death on her way home from another drinking spree. I can't even imagine how my mother endured it and didn't break down. She worked two jobs and managed to exchange her apartment with an additional payment so that her little brothers lacked for nothing. Now there. Respected people. You can't say they had an easy childhood after going through all that. Tina had almost no doubts left. Julia was undoubtedly her cousin. There were just too many resemblances in appearance and minor details. Everything pointed to the fact that, at some point, her mother had been one of the girls whom their common grandmother hadn't wanted to raise. This revelation gave Tina a chance to finally find close blood relatives. For the first time on this emotionally challenging day, she was ready to be genuinely happy. These are fantastic news. I always dreamed of having more family. However, judging by Julia's sudden silence, Tina understood that the most challenging part of their family history was yet to come. She wasn't wrong. The guest, who seemed to be her cousin, continued. Unfortunately, my tough childhood made my mother incredibly strict with me. No, she never physically abused me, but I would cringe in fear at the sound of her threatening whisper. Anyway, I got used to living in fear, and my mother didn't expect me to defy her, especially not by falling in love. Antonio, my classmate, charmed me to the point where I got pregnant. When my mother found out about the pregnancy, she screamed at me. Oh, it was a nightmare. I couldn't take it, so I ran away. Antonio quickly denied any involvement in my pregnancy, and I ended up hurt by the betrayal. I moved to another city with almost no money. I guess my guardian angel is completely gray-haired now, but somehow, everything worked out. I got together with a man named Sancho. He knew I was expecting a child, but he didn't oppose it. In fact, he was fine with it. He knew I was pregnant, but he didn't object. Anyway, everything was fine. I and my child had a roof over our heads. I was instructed to take care of the household, educate myself, and assist Sancho in various ways. He didn't hold back, paying for everything we needed and more. 
but as Sylvia grew older, I noticed more and more how this man was breaking her spirit. My partner turned out to be even more controlling than my mother. Then, two months ago, I bumped into Antonio on the street. My first love, my daughter's father, the traitor, many words fit him, but suddenly, I realized that he was the only one who could save Sylvia and me. I asked him to take us somewhere far away while Sancho traveled abroad to clear his head, as he put it. Antonio promised to think about it. And yesterday, he spontaneously showed up and said he would take us to his childhood village. That's how we ended up here. Juliet and Tina talked until almost dawn, sharing the details of their biographies. It turned out they liked the same books. They both had a passion for architecture and design. There were so many coincidences that the women no longer doubted their relationship. They didn't sleep much that night, but they didn't mind. In the morning, after breakfast, Julia went to the hospital to see her daughter. Tina, on the other hand, hurried to the cemetery to pay her respects to her grandfather and thank him for calling her to the countryside home in her dream, which had opened her eyes to the true nature of Antonio. Tina tidied up the graves of her relatives and even managed to fix the headstones when Julia returned from the district center. Hello, Tina. Sylvia sends her regards. She's getting better. The attending doctor said she'll be discharged next week, Julia shared at the lunch table. Tina was genuinely relieved. She had been worried about the girl. During the meal, the hostess turned to Julia. You know, don't rush to refuse, but I think it's time for you to reconcile with your mother. Of course, it's not really my business, but you do understand she wasn't strict with you out of malice. You can't even imagine how much I'd love to hug my mother right now. And you voluntarily gave up that opportunity because your pregnancy wasn't met with enthusiasm. Besides, I'm dying to meet my aunt. Julia smiled. You know, I was actually thinking about suggesting the same thing. Once Sylvia recovers, we'll all go visit my mother. I can just imagine her surprise. Tina had to return to the city, but she arranged to call her cousin daily. You stay here in the house. It's not too far to the district center from here, and there's plenty of food. See you soon. On the next weekend, Juliet and Sylvia, along with Tina, found themselves as guests in the presence of a majestic woman they never knew before but now recognized as their grandmother. When everyone calmed down and wiped away their tears, it was Tina's turn. Eleonora, you don't know me, but I'm your niece. Julia and I received the test results, and there's no doubt about it. We're cousins. The woman looked emotionally at her relative, whom she had never even suspected existed. Tina told her story, and her aunt was deeply moved. Sometimes I dreamt of girls who were briefly with us, and then they disappeared. But all attempts to find anyone were unsuccessful. The women drank coffee and believed that new happy chapters would begin in their destinies. Antonio tried to regain Tina's favor, but was rejected. Julia, who had moved in with her mother and daughter, also declined his advances. The cousins often met. On New Year's Eve, while strolling through the festive square, they met some pleasant men. Eleonora approved of the admirers of her beloved daughter and niece, and later that summer, there was a joyous double wedding. Tina, who had always been wary of fate's tricks, was finally proved wrong in her gloomy premonitions. Ever since she met Juliet and Eleonora, joy in her life has no longer been accompanied by misfortune. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.